Well, good morning. Our scripture reading this morning will come from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. So let me read to that for you, and then we'll begin with prayer and then hear from God from His Word. The Word of the Lord says in Matthew 2, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where Christ was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what kind, what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the children, and when you have found, or for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. And in verse 9, after listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star. They had seen when it rose, went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Let's pray. Our Father, we come to you again this morning in prayer with hopes that you will speak to us now from your word. Teach us what you want us to know. Guide our hearts in transforming ways. And may your spirit pour out on us so that we might see your son as the Magi saw him, the king. We pray this in his name, Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Well, I want to welcome you again to this somewhat of a gathering in your own homes of Enid and B. the next several weeks. Uh, maybe different than what the last several weeks have been. Lord willing, the, the city will open up and we'll be allowed to worship together in safety. Uh, our elders have been praying for this, and I know that a lot of you have been praying for this, so hopefully the next several weeks will look very different than the past several weeks. So as we look now into the Gospel of Matthew, like I told you last week, we're starting out in chapter 2, because if you'll remember, or if you were just now joining us uh, from months ago, we uh, went through chapter 1 of Matthew uh, during the Christmas season, where we talked about where Jesus came from in his family and also his birth. So with us now looking into Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, we'll be covering this This week and next week, as I preach from this passage, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever been asked to prove something? You know, maybe it's in math, or maybe it's on an essay, or maybe you've said something to a spouse, and either in anguish or in jest, they've said, prove it. I think that's what the Gospel of Matthew does again and again and again. He proves that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah. William Barclay, 20th century Scottish minister, says this about the book of Matthew. When we turn to Matthew, we turn to the book which may be well called the most important single document of the Christian faith. For in it, we have the fullest and most systematic account of the life and the teachings of Jesus. So for the next several months and even years, we'll be going through the book of Matthew. Certainly, we'll we'll take breaks. So in a couple of months, we'll take a four-week break to do a topical series on the church, and obviously come Christmas, we'll, we'll do Christmas, and then Easter, we'll do Easter, and if there's another break in between that, we'll certainly not be bashful about pouring into that, but I'm planning at least 100 sermons from the book of Matthew, and I can't wait. And the reason of this really intense focus of this book is because this is an overwhelmingly exhaustive book about the person of Jesus. There's nothing more that I'd rather spend my time looking at, and hopefully there's nothing more you'd rather spend your time looking at than the the person of Jesus, the object of our faith and the object of our joy. 
But also this book is, the reason why we're going so slow through this, is because this book is so jam-packed with other pieces of Scripture. Uh, The book of Matthew quotes directly from the Old Testament over 60 times. And there are countless of other illustrations and impressions from the Old Testament that as we go through the book of Matthew, we're going to have to pause bit by bit and go back to places like Micah or Isaiah or even back to Genesis, where we'll see that Matthew is proving that Jesus is the fulfillment of these prophets' words, where he is the true outcome of the lineage of David that people had been longing for for generations. In fact, Matthew quotes uh, the Old Testament more than any other gospel. So it makes sense that it's very long, and it also, I think, hopefully will make sense that we'll spend a long time in it. But to give you first a snapshot of the gospel of Matthew as a whole, if you're using an outline, there are two points, and the first one is the snapshot of the gospel of Matthew, and then the second point is actually the point of the text, or at least part of the point of the text. I want to give you briefly a snapshot of the gospel of Matthew. Take a, take a look at just who the author is. Now, you can save some time. The author of Matthew is Matthew. That's right. He doesn't identify himself by starting out the letter, by talking about himself, but the way that we would know this throughout all of church history, and and no one in church history disagrees with this except for some people starting about 150 to 200 years ago, is oftentimes in his own writings, he would scribe his name at the end, and then whenever these letters started to circulate, when it was clear that it was from Matthew, other transcribers would also write down, this is from Matthew, or they would sign Matthew's name at the bottom. It's something that's never been disputed. So Matthew, or he's also called Levi, is the author of this text. But he's not just the author of the text, he's known as a tax collector. Now in Jesus' time, uh, Israel was under Rome's rule. So they would have been under Rome's rule for about 60 to 70 years at this point. And, and Rome was an, an oppressive country, especially on people on the outside of them. And one of the ways that they were incredibly oppressive towards people was not just physically, but also financially. That's really how you get a grip of someone's life, right? You, you control their finances. And they really had two ways to control people's finances as Rome over Israel. They had what was called a poll tax, which would be like our own income tax. And they also had something like a property tax, which would be like our own property taxes. And the way that they would do these taxing works is you could bid on behalf of your region to collect taxes for Rome on behalf of the region. So imagine if I wanted to collect taxes on behalf of Garfield County. I would do that, and the way that I would earn an income of that is I would charge a fee on top of the taxes. So If you were taxed $100, I might put a 5% tax on that, so I get $5, and you ultimately pay $105. But let's say that Garfield County is very populous, and I want to hire out other people to help me collect taxes. They would hire out tax collectors, which is what Matthew was. He was a hired-out tax collector. He would also receive his profit as a businessman by charging you a little bit extra on top of what I would charge him a little bit extra so that he makes a profit, I make a profit, and ultimately, you keep paying taxes, right? So you can imagine what people like Matthew would look like in the midst of his own neighbors. And in fact, our, our scriptures doesn't shy away from telling us what tax collectors look like. And in fact, our scriptures align tax collectors with how society would view tax collectors by calling them alongside sinners and prostitutes and Gentiles. Go ahead, if you have a Bible, turn to the book of Matthew chapter 9. So flip over just a couple of chapters, big number 9, chapter 9, and then look at verses 10 and 11. We see here that this is who Jesus ultimately came for, where, where Matthew is being described here. It says in verse 10, and as Jesus reclined at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? That's how Matthew would be seen. But also, not just how he'd be seen by Pharisees, but also people within the church, tax collectors were also viewed as people that they didn't want to touch. Turn over even more to Matthew 18. 
Matthew 18 is known, amongst other things, as being the chapter that Christians go to when they want to understand church discipline. So when someone is acting in such a way that is defaming Christ's name, this passage says that you should treat them like this. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. And if, you, and if he listens to you, you have gained your brother. So imagine your friend living in sin. Maybe they are a known cheater, or maybe they're sleeping with their boyfriend, or maybe they're living with someone that they shouldn't be living with in a sexual way. And, and so you would go to them and say, brother or sister, like for Christ's name and for Christ's glory, repent of the sin and, and, and turn back to the cross. And if they do, you've, you've won a brother. But then if they refuse, this text goes on to say, uh, look at verse 16, it says, but if he does not listen to you, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. So imagine that same person. Maybe they're living with their boyfriend and they are pursuing an adulterous relationship and they're fornicating outside of the marriage bed and you go to them with other people and you say, look, man, we've, we all are Christians with you. We go to the same church. We love the same Savior. Like, please return from your sin and cling to the Lord. And if, the passage says, if that person still denies not just you, no, it's not personal anymore, but other people, meaning the band of the church, then what do you do there? You take it to the church. And if that person refuses still, so keep looking at verse 17, and if that person refuses still to listen even to the church, meaning the place where they have covenanted with, the place where they have promised their love and have received a promise of love to, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. What a remarkable thing for this passage to call our attention to as a whole. This whole book is describing the gospel of Jesus through the lens of a former tax collector. And in many ways, this this draws our attention to the exact kind of people that Jesus comes for. The despised, the weak, the sinful. And by the power of the Spirit, he saves them and brings them to himself to where they deny their former ways. Now, that's just the attitude of a tax collector, but in many ways, Matthew as a book is very helpful to us because it is like you would imagine someone who's an accountant or a CPA would be. It's organized, right? It's orderly and it's concise. It it has almost a, a forensic drama of Jesus being the Messiah, like you might investigate Jesus or put him on trial. And what Matthew does is it gives a case to the jury so that there's no doubt that Jesus is the Lord and Jesus is the Messiah. But we also see that the author here is a disciple. Matthew was a tax collector, but he was also called by Jesus. We don't know what he was like before he was called, but we do see bits and pieces of what he was like after he was called. He was referred to as a disciple. So again, turn over to, now turn back to Matthew chapter 9, Matthew chapter 9, and it shows us what it looks like to be a disciple. This is Matthew being called to be a disciple. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. So Matthew was writing this in third person, and he said to him, Jesus said to Matthew, follow me. And he rose and he followed him. That's what it means to look like or to live like a disciple. You follow Jesus. Now, what's so incredible about this to me is Matthew doesn't make any attempt to make the gospel of Matthew about Matthew. He makes all attempt to make the gospel of Matthew the good news of Jesus. And this is in many ways a dark contrast to how our culture often places ourselves in the midst of a story. You know, I far too often want to tell a story about someone else, but I I somehow want to place myself there. Like if I'm going to tell you about a Super Bowl, I'm also going to tell you not just the winner and loser, but also what I was doing when I was watching it, right? What I was eating when I was watching it, who I was with, or maybe I saw an important speech. But one of the important things about that speech is that I was in attendance. Matthew doesn't do that. And what an example for us. So that's Matthew, a tax collector and a disciple of Jesus Christ, or a former tax collector and an ongoing disciple of Jesus Christ. Briefly, also, I want you to see the arrangement of this book as a whole. This book is, well, it's not a biography, 
And it's not even what is called in the ancient Greco-Roman world as a bios. A bios is like a large, inclusive biography. A bios is a story about an individual that would include this person's ancestry, and even this person's teaching and actions, and this person's virtue. And, and what makes it different than a biography is, is it would include their own death and, and how that would look. So it's not like a biography, but it's also not like an ancient Greco-Roman bios, B-I-O-S. It's like a bios plus, where the story structures of the Gospel of Matthew take the same shape of the stories from the Old Testament. So even the birth narrative of Jesus, it's much like the the birth narrative of Moses, isn't it? Or some of the things that Jesus will do, it's told in the same framework as many actions of Samuel. So it takes on an Old Testament feel. But it's also different than a normal bios because it's apocalyptic, meaning it's discussing this world and the world to come. And it's eschatological in nature, meaning that it is talking about the consummation of all of history. It's proclaiming God's saving work, and it's making claims beyond a traditional bios, and certainly claims beyond a biography, because what our book will do is claim that all of history is consummated in the person of Jesus. It's saying that Jesus has brought the kingdom of God to earth. It's saying that Jesus is a model for us to follow. That's why we are disciples of Jesus, or followers of Jesus, because he is worth emulating our life after. But, But also it's saying that he's divine. He's not like us. He's divine. And not just a figure of a past, but presently alive. So there are two, or there are three major movements in the arrangement of this text. There's Jesus' pedigree, where Matthew very meticulously and carefully goes through where Jesus came from and why that's significant. But then secondly, it also talks about his proclamation. In many ways, this would be the second most famous thing we know about Jesus, things that he said, like in the Sermon on the Mount, or things that he did, actions of healing people and knowing what people are thinking. But then lastly, not just his pedigree or his proclamation, but it shows most famously Jesus' passion, where he shows the disciples the ways of the kingdom that he has brought and showing them that his humiliation will come before his exaltation. And it shows all of that. So it's an incredible thing. It's amazing that it's not thousands and thousands of pages long. But again, remember, we're listening to an accountant here, so he wants to be very precise and concise. This book is heavily dependent on an understanding and seeing things in the Old Testament. So we'll go back and forth a lot of the time where where various clues in Old Testament arrangements make the text seem brighter. And as a way to illustrate that, I just want your attention to be on the passage that we will be going through this morning. If you look at chapter 2, you'll notice if you just look at the text you'll notice that some words are distinctly different within the printing of the text. So in my copy of the ESV, there's something that sticks out and is indented. And it is a direct quote from the Old Testament. Or maybe yours are bolded or all capitalized. In the first three chapters of Matthew, there are five direct quotations from the Old Testament. And those direct quotations actually form a framework of how we're supposed to see the argument of Jesus' birth narrative play out. So just look at chapter 1, verse 23. You may have to turn back one page. So chapter 1, verse 23, it says that, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. This is a quotation from Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, where it's talking about the, the foretelling or a prophetic work of the Messiah who will come, and we see it play out in live form in chapter 1. Or in chapter 2, within our passage today, look at verse 6. It says, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people of Israel. This is a quotation from Micah, chapter 5, verse 2, where it is showing not only what Jesus will do, he'll be a shepherd to his people, but also where you can find him, the very town of Bethlehem, which will surprise even King Herod. A third quotation is down in chapter 2, verse 
15, where it says, out of Egypt, I call my son. From Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, where it's talking about this deliverance. Well, Jesus will emerge from Egypt in the, in the same way, or maybe in a way that Moses could have only hoped to emerge from Egypt in delivering his people, but Jesus will do so in saving his people. Fourthly, look down at verse 18 of chapter 2, where it says, A voice was heard in Ramah weeping and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. A quotation from Jeremiah 31, verse 15, where it shows the, the awfulness of the sin that will continually build up even from the beginning of Jesus' life is being brought out in his life. And then lastly, in in chapter 3, it says in verse 3, For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of the one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. The quotation here from Isaiah 40, verse 3, where it's this salvific announcement that John the Baptist gives where he's almost pointing people to Jesus by saying, This is what happened, this is what was foretold. I'm now announcing from the wilderness, but now... Look at the one who will make your path straight. Now, this is easy for you to do as well. So if you just look at my copy of the Bible, I've highlighted the different sections, but I got all of those from the small print at the bottom of the page. So you too can notice things different and look down at the small, ver- or small numbers and letters in the bottom of the page and take the time to go back to the Old Testament. Because what Matthew allows us to do is really see not only the person of Jesus, but also the one who was longed for for a long time show up. So use those cross-references and see this beautiful arrangement that Matthew gives us in this text. Now the application, finally in this first section, the application of Matthew is a precise proclamation. The good news is proclaimed easily from this text. If you were to ask any of the apostles, what they were doing when they were scribing under the inspiration of the Spirit, when they were writing down the words that we would later have in books like Romans or James or 1 Corinthians or in Ephesians, what they were trying to do is they were trying to apply and clarify all the things that Jesus taught and accomplished through his death and resurrection and his ascension. What they're doing is they are summarizing what's been summarized to us in Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and ascension. So this is why we actually lock those two things together. This is why you don't just need the Gospels. You don't just need the Apostles' work. You don't just need the Old Testament. You need all of God's Word because all of it is God's Word and all of it is profitable. And what we see these people do in the Apostles' works is clarify and apply the very work and person of Jesus' life for us. It's also discipleship-oriented, where Matthew, as a person, is taking us to a a vertical view of Jesus while also taking us to a horizontal view of how we are to live our lives. You think about the vertical view of Jesus. Our eyes are always on the person of Jesus in the text, but also a horizontal view where we are being shown through almost Matthew's own penmanship what it looks like to be a disciple. Now, a disciple is a follower of Jesus. A disciple is one who is being taught or being shown how to follow Jesus. A discipler is one who's teaching someone else to follow Jesus. Mark Dever really helped me in understanding what discipleship looks like. Mark Dever is a pastor in Washington, D.C., and also a notable author on the things of the church. He says that discipleship is deliberately doing spiritual good with someone else, so that they will be more like Christ. Discipleship is doing something deliberately, spiritually good with someone else, so that they will be more like Christ. And for us, the book of Matthew is a great text of discipleship, where we keep our our face on the person of Jesus to the point where we want to be like him and we grow like him by the power of the Spirit. And ultimately, the book of Matthew and its application shows us that Jesus, the Messiah King, is the object of our worship. He's the distinct object of our worship. And this is something that is shown over and over again, not just in the book of Matthew, but in other gospels, but also other apostolic works like James or Romans or even Revelation, where he 
is the object of our worship and nothing else. So that is what it looks like for the gospel of Matthew to be shown. But then secondly here, for our case in your outline, I want to secondly show you now to our text, finally, the significance of the Magi. Next week, I hope to focus more in depth on the person of Herod and also what it means like for there to be a kingmaker and a king and then also another king and how that is a very tense time in all of their lives. But here, I want to show you the significance of the Magi and how that shows us maybe a little bit of what we don't like about our own worship, but also gives us a demonstration of how we can better worship Jesus. So the significance of the Magi. The damaging part of this is that a lot of the things that you and I have been told or even sung around Christmas time aren't really in the Bible. So we don't know how the Magi showed up. We don't know how many of them there were. Church uh, legend has that there were three guys and they all had different names and that they were later baptized by Thomas. And even there's a place in the ancient world where you can go and see their skulls. And the reality is that's not true. We actually don't know that. We, don't, we can't identify them as people in particular. We don't know how many of them were there. We just know that they visited from the east. They came to the west and they found Jesus announcing that, that he was the born king of the Jews. But it was some time later that they would have shown up. You might have a manger scene in mind from your own house where all the pieces of the nativity scene are there, even the three wise men. Oh, they wouldn't have come like the next day. Uh, and we know this because Mary would have gone through her purification stage. The, the baby would have been circumcised on the eighth day. And, and they would have even had a sacrifice for him. And we know that their sacrifice on his behalf was given of, of people who were impoverished. So normally you would, you would pay for a lamb to be sacrificed on behalf of your child. And they gave two turtle doves showing their impoverishedness. But we recognize that the three wise men... We recognize the wise, see how easy it is? We recognize that the wise men showed up and they gave them gold. So Mary and Joseph would have used that gold to pay for a greater sacrifice, but these men would have shown up maybe three months later, up to two years later. We know it couldn't be more than two years because Herod would have wanted to slaughter everyone who was around the age of the person of Jesus. And so he slayed everyone under two years old in that area, even though Jesus was able to escape. Now, a brief survey of what they did, this, these magi. They came from the east and wound up first in Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem was seven miles away from Bethlehem, so the, Jesus was in Bethlehem. And if you're looking at a map, just seven miles up would be Jerusalem. And it was there that they were asking people, have you heard of this baby who was born king of the Jews? And Herod would have heard about this, and it caused him, our text says, to be greatly troubled when he heard this. This puts us somewhere between 37 and 4 BC, because that's when King Herod the Great would have been ruling in that time. So we would guess that Jesus was born around 6 to 4 BC. Now, Bethlehem is significant here because it's near Jerusalem where Jesus would still be as a baby, and he was born not in a barn, but probably something that would look like a cave. Uh, but it happened to be somewhere between months and two years from his own birth. Uh, and we know that, and it's not only significant in that it's identified here, but it's also significant in that Bethlehem was the scene of, of Ruth's life with Boaz in the Old Testament, in Ruth, Ruth chapter 1, and even identified with Boaz in uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse 5. It's significant because Bethlehem was the home of David, the descendant of Ruth, and ancestor of Jesus. David was born here and anointed king by Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 17. And, and the town came to be known as the city of David. We see that in Luke chapter 2. So Jesus was born in this town. And it's not just neat because it's near the place of Jerusalem. And that's where the Magi showed up. And it's not only neat because all these other cool historical things happened in that town but also it was incredible to think about because Jerusalem was referred to as the house of bread, where out of this house of bread would come the bread of life, the true manna from heaven. Bethlehem's role is significant, not only in its history, but also in the foretelling that we would see in Micah 
chapter 5, verse 2, where when the wise men show up and they're asking where Jesus is, that freaks out Herod. So Herod grabs his own, you could call them wise men, or his own court of counselors, and he's asking about this. And, and what do you know? They knew exactly where this king of the Jews would be born because they had heard from the prophets in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. So the quote there in your copy of the Bible in verse 6, that is actually quoted from the mouths of Herod's own servants, which would give the answer to the Magi, which would lead the Magi to the very place and the star would show where Jesus is. Herod, Herod though, was startled at the question. He was startled at the question because just listen to the question. Keep in mind that Herod is king. and is not only king, but he is king of the Jews. And these magi show up and they ask, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? And notice there that they don't ask Herod that question. They're asking other people in town that question. They're not even recognizing that the king of this area is king of the Jews, even though this king of this area is legally the king of the Jews. They're they're asking where the one who's been born is. And this would have caused Herod to be troubled. He gathered his smart company and asked them about this, and they tell him where the child was born. And so Herod then goes to the wise men and asks them a peculiar question. In verse 7, it says, Summon the wise men secretly and ascertain from them what time the star had appeared. Now, this is an interesting phrase. and In fact, Martin or Marvin Vincent says that what Herod was really asking was, how long does the star make itself visible since it's rising in the east? Herod is paranoid, you have to keep in mind. He's, he's wondering if his rule is going to be over because Herod actually kind of fell into his own role and connived his way into his own role, purchased his own rule in many ways by, by marrying into the Jewish heritage and going through a sacrificial system by becoming a Jew himself. And so he asked them if they're noticing that the star told them to come to Jerusalem, he asked them, how long has that star been up there? Almost to ask, does anyone else know about this or is that just you guys? Because if other Jewish people are knowing about this, then I might be in trouble because you guys aren't even Jewish, yet you apparently know who the king of the Jews is. And I'm the king of the Jews. He asked them how long the star made itself visible. Herod had ceremonially converted to Judaism in order to have a firmer grip on his rule. He had intentionally married into this group. He, his people even knew the prophet's testimony. And when asked where the king and the Jews would be born, they knew. They pointed these people to Bethlehem. So was this the beginning of the end for Herod? He had worked so hard to become their leader. But were the wise men ratting him out? Now the wise men, back to them, where did they come from? To be blunt, uh, they came from the east. That's where they came from. We think they most directly came from Persia. We don't have a specific town. And, and what were they like? Who are they? And to be blunt again, they were eastern magi who were Zoroastrians, meaning that they had a mixture of astrology and black magic. So they were known for all the things that they knew, but they weren't, just, uh, they weren't just great, intelligent people who were able to do a lot of things. They also played in the dark arts, something that you should never play with or even joke about. And when people try to live a life that is mixing and meshing with black magic, they are not to be trifled with. They were monotheistic, pre-Islamic, in their pursuit of trying to understand the world. They would have been founded around 6th century BC. And our greatest parallel to what these men would be like would be, well, the wise men of what we see in Daniel chapter 2, where we see these same kind of people. They were brilliant. They were rulers. They were kingmakers. They were smart. And they were even used by kings to help them understand the ways of the earth. And they were sorcerers. Not in a good way. They were divine priests, or they were spiritual mediums. They were some of the highest ranking people in Daniel's time. They were prominent because of their knowledge, and they were feared because of their sorcery. 
There are even some uh, countries today that are ruled in this way, right? They have a king, but they also have kind of a religious sect that is encouraging them or telling them how they ought to rule. And, and if they might declare something on behalf of the country, they, they kind of look to their left and go, right? Like that's, that's what God would want, right? And then they shake their fist even more. And in this case, this is how these men would act. They were brilliant by all accounts, and they played with dark magic, and they thought that they knew the future and could manipulate the time, even though they said that they worshipped one God. The term magos, which is where we get magi and even where we get wise men, appears in one other place in the New Testament. So in this context, but also this word appears in one other place, and that place is Acts 13, verses 6 through 10, where a sorcerer is someone who Paul portrayed like this. Paul portrayed a sorcerer or a magi like this, full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. (laughs) What a way to be described, right? Full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Not a great friend. Or a son of the devil, an enemy of all that is right. These beliefs would most likely be similar to the wise men that we encounter in Matthew chapter 2. So think about it. Brilliant men, equipped in all the knowledge of science, agriculture, mathematics, history, religious text. After Daniel's influence, remember Daniel would have had a great influence over them and in some ways may have tipped the scales towards the very person of the Lord, might have had an influence over them to where they would know the Mosaic text. They would know the prophetic books. So they probably would have read things like Micah or Daniel or Jeremiah. And so they, they saw this bright light and they knew it had to be something about God. And they went. But keep in mind these brilliant men under the influence of all this ancient rule, highly influential of their politics. These people would have been keen makers. And here they show up on Herod's doorstep and they look at the king of the Jews with all these valuable gifts guided by a heavenly light and they say, where's the king of the Jews that's been born? The king of the Jews who has been born is not Herod. Imagine receiving that kind of word. So Herod connivingly gathers them and says, well, my, my buddies over here say that he's in Bethlehem. Go there. And, and when you get there, come back and tell me exactly where he is because I, I would like to bring my own gift, right? I'd like, to, I'd like to worship him like you do. It's almost like he's crossing his fingers behind his back. I want to I help you guys out and really pour out a parade for this guy. And they're like, okay. And so they go on to Bethlehem. Now, where did these men come from? The Magi, probably from Babylon or Persia. The New American Standard says they came from the east, but they came from where a light first shined, in the east. And so they went west. Now, why did they come? This is very important. Why did they come? They came, think about it. What's the structure of Matthew telling us? In Matthew chapter 1, so far, in the very first part, we saw that Jesus is being proven and claimed to come from the right family, right? So he has the right ancestry. That's why he is God. That's why he is the Son. That's why he is the Messiah. But then secondly, in the second part, of Matthew chapter 1, Jesus is born of a virgin, not inheriting man's sin, so he's not under the condemnation that you and I are in our sinful ways, so he's proving that he is unique and different, the very son of God, he's without sin, and here comes chapter 2, where the wise men show up, and they say, where is the king of the Jews that has been born? Jesus here, here's why they came, they're coming to authorize him or crown him or recognize him or affirm him as the king, the long-awaited Messiah. Jesus is being recognized from kingmakers from far away as the king of the Jews. Now, many commentators believe that this is showcasing the irony of the world recognizing the glory of God when the Jewish people had the Messiah right under their own nose. It took men from far away to recognize the glory of the Son. And we say it's ironic because, keep in mind, Matthew would have lived a lot of his life as being despised and hated by people like the Pharisees or even people like the Jewish people. He was ostracized. And maybe as a way to show them, look what not even you saw, but these ungodly people from the east saw. The journey of these non-Israelites to Jerusalem to worship 
the king of the Jews recalls the vision expressed in the prophets. So you think of Isaiah chapter 2 or Micah chapter 4 of all nations, many peoples converging on Mount Zion in the future and seeking to learn God's ways and walk in God's paths. The summons of the Magi to visit Jesus demonstrates God's intention to save Gentiles from their futile religions. Jesus would later go on to cast out demons, people who would have been possessed like these Magi were. And say, or Jesus would go on to break Satan's grip on people's lives. And this is truly what conversion looks like to the Christian. Someone who's far away or far off. Someone who is dead in their sins. Someone who is considered, like our scriptures would call them, an enemy of God and are by the Spirit, their hearts are regenerated. Their hearts are made new to where God's power compels them like a light in the darkness to himself. Friend, this is just a small expose on what it looks like to actually follow Jesus, where where God in some way shakes you up to where you see his glory, to where you see his goodness and in mercy that he has for you, to where you recognize that it was this Jesus that we're talking about in the scriptures who was sent by the Father out of love, who would live a perfect life and who would die a perfect substitutionary death on the cross to forgive you of your sins. And by placing your trust in him or by placing your faith in him and by worshiping him with your whole heart, you know, imagine the Magi giving gold, frankincense, and myrrh. What Jesus wants out of you is your whole heart, your whole life. You can know that you are in the safe arms of the Lord. This compelling expose of a light shining forth, drawing you to himself. Friend, I pray that is you today, that the Lord is summoning you to himself by his word and that you would cling to Jesus and call on him to save you. And this is what the Magi in part show us. But how did they find Jerusalem? How did they get there? Well, they got there in part by a star. It says in verse 2, For we saw a star when it rose, and have come to worship him. NASB says we saw a star in the east, like I said before. Now, the nature of this star, we have a pretty good idea, but there are different ideas about it. Some believe that this was just a star out there, a bright star. You know, we do this at a nativity scene where we hang a star. Brooke and I hang a star over our Christmas tree. You know, maybe we shouldn't. Maybe we should. I don't know. It has lights on it, so it's like a bright star. But anyway, it's like a star. People think it might have been a star. Maybe it was a planet of Jupiter, which is notably being um, associated with birth of kings. Or maybe it was, some people think it was a conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn in a certain kind of alignment that's called the sign of the fish that would have led them there. Or maybe it was a comet acting erratically. It, It could be any of those, frankly. Now, I agree mostly or most intensely with a couple of other commentators that what I think the Magi saw is not a comet or not a star, not an alignment of planets, but an actual showcase of the glory of God in the heavens. Some call this the the Shekinah glory is what they would have seen. The sending of the sun wouldn't just have spiritual and uh, eternal implications, but the the sending of the sun and him taking on human flesh had, a, had such a heavenly trajectory of glory that it would have caused almost the heavens open up and the Lord's glory would have been seen by these people in the Far East to the point where they, they don't know what they saw, but it made them move. And it brought them to the very place of Jerusalem to where they started asking, where is the one who is the king of the Jews? And there in verse 9, the star not only sent them to Jerusalem, but then prodded by other people to go down to Bethlehem, what they saw really showed them where Jesus was. And it says, And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. So here we, we recognize this surely isn't a star like you and I think of a star in like a third grade science project. Because how could a star be way up in the sky and now it's standing on top of a house where Jesus would have stood? But either way, the glory of the Lord is atop this house. Now the word star in the Greek, astur, can also be translated as a beam of light or a showcase of radiance. 
in this beam of light or radiance or star is now standing over the house where Jesus was. And what they found, what the glory of God showed them, was the very Messiah himself. And with them, they brought three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And this is a really cool part to me of how this all adds up. I mean, you can just see how Matthew, you can just study this stuff forever and ever, right? And it's going to feel like we are, frankly. But you can keep peeling away at the different layers where gold, frankincense, and myrrh, gold, the most precious of metals, a universal symbol of nobility and royalty, frankincense, this very costly, attractive smelling incense that was used for special occasions. It was used in the temple. It was used at weddings. It was used at royal processions. You can see how this gets cooler and cooler and cooler. In the book of Revelation, there is no temple in the new heavens and earth because Jesus is there. There will be a great wedding feast for all of God's people to enjoy with him. And it will be like a royal procession where the Son brings us to the very glory of the Father. But then lastly, myrrh, a valuable perfume that was used for various occasions when mixed with different elements. It was used as ointments or is used as perfume. But amazingly, in our case, and truly symbolic for us, It was used in preparation of bodies as they were being prepared for burials. At the very beginning of Jesus' life, kings from the east, kingmakers from the east, brought myrrh. And if they only knew that that same kind of thing would be applied like 33 years later when Jesus was put into a tomb on behalf of his people, saving them forever from their sins. What did they do here? Not only what do they bring, but what do they do? Remember what they practically did? In verse 2, they came and continually asked questions. In verse 9, they went to Jesus after Herod directed them where they were a part of his plan. Or we don't know, maybe that was their plan all along, but they certainly found their answer to the point where when in verse 10, they saw the star, they greatly rejoiced because what they'd been longing for and walking for and traveling for was finally in their midst. But in verse 11... The great impact of this text, when they saw what they had been longing to see, the child, they fell down and they worshiped. Two things, they fell down and they worshiped. It's not that they just fell down in adoration, but they worshiped the object of what they were aiming for. Now, numerous occasions, Jesus received worship like this. Matthew 2, here in the wise men, and Matthew 14, Jesus had come to the disciples walking on the water, uh, and it says that they were in the boat worshiping him, saying, of a truth thou art the Son of God. In John chapter 9, concerning the blind man whose sight was restored, when he washed in the pool of Siloam, it is said, and he worshiped him. Or in Matthew 28, after the resurrection, the disciples went into Galilee to the place where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. And then finally, when Jesus ascended, In Matthew 24, he parted from them and was carried into the heavens, and they worshiped him. He never denied this type of adoration, this type of affection, this type of worship. And so the question here in this text, there's a lot of tension, there's a lot of drama, there's a lot of a lot going on in this text, but the biggest takeaway is, well, for me, do I act toward Jesus like they acted toward Jesus? Do I see him too casually? Do I see him as the one at the finish line? Do I see him as the one that all of my life has been building up towards and is influencing every single ounce of my own life? As the month goes on, as the months and months go on in this book, is this the aim of your affections? Christian, is this the the aim of your affections that never seems to get old? You know, I've told you before that my favorite song, I think actually the the best, like truly the best. I know that we have like 50 best things and 50 best friends, but I think truly the best Christmas song in the world is actually the best Christian hymn of all time. Hark the herald angels sing because of so much theology about the sun is placed in that song. As a Christian, do you ever tire of thinking about the person of Jesus? Non-Christian, whether you've wandered on this YouTube or maybe you've been watching for a couple of weeks, is there anything in your life that can stand up to the glory of this Lord? Can anything outlive it? Can anything rise up to this? On numerous occasions, Jesus accepted such worship as perfectly proper. Never did he reject it as improper or misdirected. So may this be the aim of our understanding in this text. 
So in conclusion, how does Herod receive this news? We've seen how the Magi received this news, but how did Herod receive this news? Remember what they said to him. They were looking for the one who was born king of the Jews. And what did that mean? Well, that meant for Herod that on the horizon, he wasn't going to live much longer because there would be one who would come after him who would truly be king of the Jews. Others after him might mock him, but they would not outlive him. And who were these people to say this? Well, in theory, it was a warning shot that a new king was on the horizon, but in reality, these were, these were kingmakers responding to God's universal call to adore the son who would save the world. How do you think you would feel hearing this? There's much to make of this narrative. What Matthew is doing here is he is exposing many things. What Matthew is doing here is he is exposing the heart of, Mer- of Herod. He's exposing the one who continually wants to cling on to stuff that he can build up or marry into or can hold on to or can outlive or outmake. But by doing this, I think, as I've been meditating on this text and with you in mind, this really exposes an appeal to the Christian of how we often act, trying to cling on to what we think we deserve or clinging on to what we think will survive or clinging on to our idea of a legacy or our ideal of notoriety. And, and here we have to remind ourselves that, that there's another king in our lives and it's not us. And it's not anyone we know, but he's the one who is eternal and who holds all things together and who is the one who is ruling and reigning at the right hand of his father. He's also exposing, though, not just the heart of Herod, who acts like many of us as Christians, but also the heart of the Magi. Do we want what they want? Are we seeking like they are seeking? To the one who's not a Christian, Know that if you are seeking after the Lord, you will find him. If you're seeking after Jesus, you will find him. I would encourage you to do what Herod's friends did. Pour yourself into the book and join us as we go through this text together. May may what you look for show itself in the very person of Jesus that we'll see in the book of Matthew. Those who look for Jesus will see him. Those who truly see him will worship him like the Magi. And those who worship him will give themselves over to him. The gold and spices were presented not to Mary, but unto him, our passage says. And so won't you give your life over to him? In him you have the fullness and the goodness and the mercy of God in your midst. So I would beg of you and ask of you to be consumed by his glory, to fall on the floor and to worship him, to to do what this gospel will tell us to do, to repent and believe. If you don't know where to look, look in the book. For all of us, as we think about this incredible narrative, there is so much here that we will continue to unpack. But notice the characters and notice the actions. Are you paranoid for what people will find out? Or do you fall on the floor and worship the one who saves you from your sins? I pray you won. Let's pray together. Our Father, we are grateful for what your text teaches us. We ask that by your Spirit's power, it will transform our hearts, that we might see you for how you are to be seen, our glorious Lord and Savior. It's in your Son's name we pray. Amen.